Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, June 29th, 2020. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. I think I've said this before, but today it is worth repeating. One of the most amazing things about the universe is that we have the capacity to understand it. More or less, it seems to behave in predictable ways that are governed by basic forces that are communicated through set particle interactions. Our current particle and field theory explanations are less than 150 years old. And in that time, we have gone from basically starting to understand electricity to living in a technologically advanced world that has to take relativity into, the, into account as we travel from place to place using GPS receivers in our phone. While I feel comfortable with our big picture understanding of the evolution of our universe, I have to acknowledge that there are places where our understanding is at best hand wavy and vague. One of those places is the period of time between the release of the cosmic microwave background radiation and the establishment of the large-scale structure of galaxies and galaxy clusters. As the story goes, our universe emerged hot and tiny, but over time expanded, and as it expanded, it cooled. What started as pure energy settled into a soup of constantly colliding electrons, photons, and atomic nuclei. This was the situation for several hundred year, hundred thousand years, and because light couldn't travel any significant distance without being absorbed during a collision, the universe during these early eras was completely opaque. About 400,000 years after the Big Bang, however, the universe finally cooled enough that electrons and nuclei could come together to form neutral atoms. And in that moment, it became possible for photons to fly away unhindered. And and this is what happened. And everywhere in the universe today that we look, we see that moment as the cosmic microwave background. It is the stage after the cosmic microwave background formation that we're struggling to understand. Initially, there was a cosmic dark ages during which nothing was giving off light. And the primary activity of the universe was the gravitational collapse of slight areas of overdensity into, well, higher density material. The gas that made up the universe was neutral, and the light of the first stars had to ionize that gas to make the universe into the largely transparent reality we have today. What we are struggling to understand is how fast and, well, how did the universe go from an almost uniform gas to being highly structured? Numerous theories and computer simulations have worked to simulate the collapse of neutral gas clouds and the formation of galaxies and their supermassive central black holes. Some of the best theories, in my opinion, depict this as a turbulent process where some of the largest galaxies in the early universe were able to form before the universe was a billion years old. This matches with our observations of galaxies that appear fully formed when the universe was only 800 million years old. It's good when reality matches theory. The problem is the more we observe, the more we have been finding galaxies at ever earlier epochs. And things have started to go from matching our expectations to challenging us to make the universe form structures faster than we thought possible. In December 2017, scientists led by Eduardo Bandadas announced the discovery of a quasar that was fully formed just 690 million years after the Big Bang. With an 800 million solar mass central black hole, it is a massive system for its time. But it is still small enough that its formation is explainable. This remarkable system also allowed scientists to begin to measure what fraction of the universe was reionized. 
It was a beginning, and it was a stretch. But all was well with our understanding of the universe. That is a whole lot of background information that allows me to now talk about today's first news story. In a new paper accepted to the Astrophysical Journal Letters, a team with first author Jin Yi Yang has announced the discovery of another super distant quasar. This one is seen 700 million years after the Big Bang. It is the second farthest and it is remarkably larger Its central supermassive black hole is 1.5 billion solar masses, making it twice the size of the 2017 discovery. For something to be this big this early in the history of the universe, the team believes that 10,000 solar mass black hole needed to have formed and been available to seed the quasar's growth just 100 million years after the Big Bang. This is a much larger black hole than we had been thinking could already exist at that point, and it would have needed to form through the singular collapse of a massive cloud of gas. Now, how something this big forms that fast is going to present new challenges. The heat released during gas collapse should throttle down the collapse, all else being equal. So there must be mechanisms that enable the collapse somehow. Or perhaps these supermassive black holes were formed in a wholly different way. While this discovery raises a lot of questions about supermassive black hole formation, it also provides some answers on the age of reionization. According to the paper on this discovery, the neutral gas fraction was about 40% at this quasar's time. And the quasar's host galaxy was forming a remarkable 210 solar masses of stars each year. This is giving us an understanding of the patchy nature of the universe's reionization and is showing us just how frenetic early star formation actually was. Studying this second most distant quasar was non-trivial and required using all the most massive telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii including the Keck, Gemini, and Eukert telescopes. As part of new efforts to better bring together Hawaii's indigenous peoples, their culture, and modern astronomy, a group of 30 teachers was invited to name this object. They came up with the name Po'ina'ina, which means unseen spinning source of creation surrounded with brilliance in the Hawaiian language. These were Hawaiian language immersion school teachers taking part in the Imaloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii's Ahoya Hi'ana program. These kinds of surprising details that this discovery has on how our universe was able to rapidly form objects, this informs us how we have to look at structure formation. And This is a reminder that while we have a big picture understanding of our universe, there are a lot of gaps in our understanding. And while we have given some of the gaps cool names like dark matter, they are nonetheless massive missing pieces of the puzzle. Since the 1930s, astronomers have known that there is invisible stuff out there, gravitationally affecting its surroundings while neither absorbing nor emitting light. For the past many years, scientists have been looking for weakly interacting massive particles so that it could explain this missing mass. So far, nothing has been found, and many, many theories have been ruled out as these massive particles fail to show up in underground vats or high-energy particle collisions. One theory that is slowly starting to gain traction is the possibility that The theoretical particle, the axion, may be the missing dark matter particle. Axions were first theorized in the 1970s as the particle that is behind a field that causes neutrons to always be electrically neutral and otherwise helps explain why we don't see particles violating the charge parity relationship. Axions, if they have a small amount of mass, could also be a constituent of dark matter just a 
very, very low mass constituent. But in large enough numbers, even the lowest mass particles could be dark matter. The issue has been theories couldn't find a way to generate enough axions to generate dark matter. Until now. Here I'm just going to read from the press release put out by the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, because I can't explain this better than they already have. By assigning a non-zero initial velocity to the axion field, the team discovered a mechanism termed kinetic misalignment, producing far more axions in the early universe than conventional mechanisms. The motion generated by breaking of the axion shift symmetry significantly modifies the conventional computation of the axion dark matter abundance. Additionally, these dynamics allow axion dark matter to react more strongly with ordinary matter, exceeding the prediction of the conventional misalignment mechanism. By assigning a non-zero initial velocity to the axion field, this team discovered a mechanism termed kinetic misalignment, producing far more axions in the early universe than conventional mechanisms. The motion generated by breaking of the axion shift symmetry significantly modifies the conventional computation of the axion dark matter abundance. Additionally, these dynamics allow axion dark matter to react more strongly with ordinary matter, exceeding the prediction of the conventional misalignment mechanism. What I really like about this theory is axions were already needed for reasons that have nothing to do with dark matter. And there have been some observations that hint at seeing the effects of axions, but the quality of the data isn't enough to say they exist with certainty. It will take a particle that has multiple reasons to exist and low signal and not entirely believable observations over a couple needed part over a custom needed particle with no observations. This is starting to remind me of the early days of looking for the Higgs boson, where teams were seeing hints of it in the data, but the noise was such that they couldn't say anything with certainty. This is the first time in a long time I felt hope that we might be able to identify a dark matter particle. We still have a long way to go. We need definitive observations, and the theories need more work. But this feels like the start of something, and we will be following this story and bringing you new results as we have them. But for now, that rounds out this show. Now, before we go, I do want to let you know that we will be taking next week off after the 4th of July. And uh, part of that time off from this show is going to be vacation, but part of it is also going to be working to plan a big event we're doing the weekend of July 17th. Uh, we're doing what's called a Cosmo Questicon. Basically, let's escape this 2020 we're living in and uh, spend a couple of days enjoying science and its intersections with creative things from art to writing to photography, dance, and more. So go check it out at CosmoQuest.org and get your tickets today. But for now, this is all we have. This has been The Daily Space. Music